the entire AI industry is growing 37% year over year. Now, all the company want to add some AI on the existing roadmap. And however, lots of existing employees are lacking the skill set to break into AI. And so what is the fastest way to do internal transition into AI per management, AI engineer, any kind of AI type of functions. In this podcast, we're going to demystify how you're able to break into AI through internal transfer, what kind of skill set you need to develop. Make sure to stay until the end of this podcast. We're going to discuss whether developers are going to be replaced by AI. Hey guys, this is Dr. Nancy Lee, a director product feature in Forbes. I've helped thousand people land a dream PM job offer in fan companies and unicorn startup and continuously get promoted as a product leader. In this channel, we talk about tech trends and free product management training. Like and subscribe and check out new video every Tuesday. In today's Product Insider podcast, we had a pleasure to invite our guest, Approva Joshi. She is currently an AI engineer advocate at MongoDB with six years experience and leading and developing different kind of AI applications. And she used to be a data scientist as well. So Approva, welcome to the show. Hey, Nancy. Thank you so much for having me here today. This is great. And actually, I seen you speaking at many like AI engineer, AI developer conferences. So I'm so glad to have you on the show to really share lots of greater insight regarding how different companies are building the AI product and how engineers and product managers working together and especially how to break into AI from many different types of background, even if you don't know how to code. And now let, let me do a, a proper intro for approval and I know when we met last time, you were giving lots of workshops and out there, but I do want people to really learn more about your background. So currently, Approva is a data scientist and turned developer advocate with over six years experience applying machine learning to problems in cybersecurity, improving, uh, including phishing detection, malware production, and the entire behavior analytics. And as AI developer advocate at MongoDB, he now uh, helps developers be successful in building AI applications through written content and hands-on workshops. And Apuba, let's do this. Um, given every single day, you said you're actually doing lots of coding yourself, trying all different kind of new AI technology framework, and you also teach other people through AI workshop to help different kind of enterprise customers and adding AI to the existing roadmap. Can you quickly break down regarding what your day-to-day -day look like and how exactly you help people to learn and break into AI fast in their current job? Okay, so as an AI developer advocate at MongoDB, I'm on the developer advocacy and enablement team, which means roughly 30% of my time is spent building proof of concepts for things that our customers might be building. Um, then sometimes when we want like to build a new workshop. So right now, a lot of people are interested in building RAG applications, building agentic applications. So if there's a requirement for uh, a workshop, then I spend a few weeks to a month building out a workshop that uh, we can use at our in-person developer events. So once I build a workshop, I also train people in the rest of America, or we have teammates in Europe, teammates in APAC. So I'll train up other trainers so they can de deliver these workshops in their geographies. Uh, what else? I, I also do something called design reviews with our customers, where it's like a one hour session where our customers can book time with um, me to talk through their use case and get some recommendations on how to go about solving it using MongoDB mm -hmm. and other tools in the AI stack. So yeah, that's kind of what uh, my day-to-day -day looks like. This is awesome. So given you engage with your customers and also do lots of research regarding the latest AI technology and how to use what kind of AI framework to solve problems for different kind of enterprise customers. And can you tell us more regarding like today, I bet a lot of existing like Fortune 500 companies or big and small companies, and they are trying to use AI into the day-to-day -day work. And however, a lot of existing employees, they don't have the right skill set to become the AI engineer. So what do you think is the fastest way for people to break into AI in their current job without jumping ship? Sure. First off, I don't think there's a quick, fast, or easy way. I think it's just a matter of starting somewhere, right? So uh, 
some ways that even I, some ways that have helped me even because I was used to doing like traditional machine learning where I was building machine learning models from scratch to solve a particular problem. But even as someone who's been a data scientist for a while, it's kind of a transition to switch to these new tools because like just the terminologies are different, the way these models work are different. So some things that have helped me are just trying to use these new models on my day-to-day -day job, right? Or even outside my job for that matter. So for example, mm -hmm. if you're used to making Google searches to search for stuff, maybe try using tools like Perplexity, which is a natural language uh, search tool and see how that experience feels. Or if you're um, a software developer who does a lot of coding on the job, maybe enable a coding assistant like Kodi or GitHub Copilot in your coding environment and see how you can use that, integrate that into your job. I also had a friend who's been a product manager for a long time, and he once told me he had about a uh, hundred different applications on his phone. And I was like, why do you have wow. so many apps? And he's like, a lot of them were just to try out uh, different products and come up with ways to improve mm -hmm. workflows in a particular product. And I think that's such an important skill to have as a product manager, just getting into that zone of thinking about different products and how they work and how they can be improved. So as a PM, I think that's a really cool thing to do, especially yeah. with so many AI tools out there. Um, mm -hmm. and I think uh, the last thing, sorry, go ahead. So with that in mind, I do agree we need to try out and play with different tools. And myself, I actually explore different tools and actually find my own way to actually use AI to do our daily operations within PM Accelerator, especially for those content creation aspective. Um, mm -hmm. But my biggest challenge when I explore all the tools was that there are so many. So yeah. which one should I stick to? Which one should I choose? And especially more technical aspect, when we build our own AI product, for example, currently we have eight teams building real life AI product inside of AI uh, PM accelerator right now. So let's really the thing, hey, one of our team is uh, using AI to transform the interior design and from a picture and then turn it into AI generated beautiful interior design for the home. So when they started, this project, They're trying to figure out how, oh, what do we do? Do we do like um, 2D floor plan and try and turn into 3D? And what kind of tool do we use? Um, and also figure out what do we do text to speech and, and then and speech to pictures or picture to pictures. There are many different ways to make it happen, different kind of framework they can choose and evaluate. And that really leads to lots of different kind of like, overwhelmed effects and well there's so many things going on and also so many existing apps going on and keep on changing yeah. every single day so how would you sure. be able to really manage the overwhelmed effect and knowing that which ones are the priorities for you to try out and also use uh, mm -hmm. i think the advice there is like don't try to do everything at once right and if if mm -hmm. you have a super nebulous problem like you're saying you want to build an interior design app that has some sort of AI functionality in it. I would say like try to chop uh, chop away at like smaller pieces. So maybe integrate AI functionality only into one part of the app to begin with. And like mm -hmm. usually the lowest lift is to just build some sort of a chat interface. But for your app, for example, if that's not uh, the best thing to do, I'm trying to think, and maybe you can help me with this. Like what's an example of the simplest thing that you can do in the application that you were just talking about. Yeah, so for example, for the home renovation project we had, um, the number one thing is, what if I give you a 2D floor plan? You know, there's like lots of designers that have like the graphic of what's supposed to be, right? So if I give mm -hmm. you the 2D floor plan, would you be able to generate a 3D image based on the 2D floor plan using AI? 2D... You have a 2D floor plan and you want to go to a 3D uh, version of that 2D floor plan. So, mm -hmm. um, so like multimodal models are, or multimodal applications are, is a domain of applications that's coming up, right? And one of the techniques that I've seen work pretty well in either multimodal or semi-structured applications where you have a combination of text and like tables and images, that kind of thing yeah. is like converting everything to one domain. 
So for example, text, because a lot of these models are good with text, right? So mm -hmm. even if you have an image, if you can um, create like a natural language summary of what the floor plan looks like, and then feed that to a multimodal model that can go from text to image, then I think that's mm -hmm. a good way of going from different modal, working with different modalities, but using a single domain. Yeah, this is awesome. Actually, our team did something similar and the team was able to do like, I think four different kind of multi uh, modality domain and trying to experiment different ways to really solve the problem. Uh, that was very yeah. exciting. They just sent me their the original MVP. Uh, it's literally a picture of his home and then the system just spit out another newly designed function of his kitchen and looks like looks the same but much prettier and his wife was like i want a new one that's great yeah <laughs> leading to, uh, lead yeah. to another consumer drive too to upgrade the kitchen uh cool sure. uh, yeah, yeah and and like disclaimer that i haven't worked as much with multimodal models but i've just played around with things out of my own interest and I really like mid journey which mm -hmm. last I checked was just a discord bot but uh, I found their image quality and just like their image expression really nice that's awesome yes our team actually explored all other models I'm very excited to see their demo which is coming in 10 days from today we'll invite you to the demo by the way For yeah sure. you should provide Thank feedback you. and see what's look like awesome and so let's also talk about like giving more adoption for employees, right? I think another key challenge for employees within the company is getting those customers and the stakeholders buy in of AI. Would you be able to touch on those topics regarding, is it really a big thing? There's all those objections. If so, how would you make them feel like, yes, AI is part of the new norms? Let me think. So at least in my organization, it's been, it's pretty clear from, top down that AI is a priority for the company and that's how it's going to be moving forward. But, mm -hmm. and I'm sure this is what's happening in a lot of companies where, yeah, like everyone wants to be at the forefront of AI and start integrating AI into their workflows. But I think the biggest challenge that organizations are facing right now is until now, until generative AI came into picture, right? Like AI and machine learning teams within organizations were kind of siloed. Siloed in the sense they were only, uh, they were mostly data scientists and machine learning engineers. And mm -hmm. there were small teams that were embedded into parts of the organization that needed it. Like there might be like uh, an, a business analytics org that might have a data science team. At my previous company, there was, uh, a data scientist team for the product as a whole. Then we had an observability product and then a security products of each of those had their own data science teams. But now with uh, more employ as AI becomes more top of mind and other mm -hmm. job functions, like people who haven't been data scientists or machine learning engineers, as they are expected to start having conversations about AI, I'm seeing a lot of companies trying to adopt this center of excellence model where yeah. they build like a central AI center of excellence, which is basically a team of experts where uh, the whole organization knows that there's this um, specific team of AI experts and that's supposed to provide employees with a central place to come for education, support, or any kind of help they need as they ramp up on AI. Yeah. What about the customers? Um, for example, as you said, uh, lots of customers actually reach out to you guys to get help saying, hey, how do we set up a new rack and new different mm. ways to solve different problems? Um, Tell us more regarding how would you actually effectively introduce AI to your customers? So I think even there, the advice is usually the same. Like they'll come to us with a huge nebulous problem. So then we try to uh, just, yeah, do some discovery to understand what's like the minimal viable product that they can start with, right? So once they build mm -hmm. something basic and take it to uh, their teams, then I think even that give that's a good exercise for them too because that helps them identify what exactly they need where the gaps are and what they're actually trying to solve for so yeah usually it's like trying to break down the problem coming up with the most uh, easy lift thing that they can go try out and then iterate from there 
This is awesome. Um, what about today? For example, for existing employees, when they need to upgrade themselves, really master AI quickly, do you have any recommended resources for people to learn AI fast? So I've been really um, impressed with what deep learning AI is doing. It's the company、mm-hmm. that Andreng founded, but. They've been doing a really great job of putting together short courses. It's not like week long or hour long courses, but short courses from all the different AI providers across the AI stack. I think it's a really good way to just get a feel for who the different vendors in the space are and what each of them are capable of. This is awesome. Actually, this is also my highly recommend resources for all of our students inside the PM、uh, AI PM Bootcamp.、Uh, yes, and my favorite course from Deep Learning the AI is actually Prompt Engineering. That one is only one hour, and actually it's the best ever. Everyone、yeah. must take it. And even if you don't have, know how to code, just go take it. They have very simple step by step. At least you understand what's the best. Methodology and what other engineers is doing, and prompt engineering actually, in my personal opinion, is a new way to code. Uh, uh moving forward, because、Agreed. maybe AI can replace soft developers in the future. But if you don't know prompt engineering, you are definitely getting replaced. <laughs> that's that's a fair statement. Yeah, I think <laughs> developers who can use AI, that's that's where things are moving at a minimum. Yeah.、Um, by the way, guys, we also have the.、Um, Top eight recommended AI courses, and I'm going to put it in the description of the show note. Everybody can just go and download and start learning those for free. Most of those courses are like within an hour long, and you can get it down very fast. And now let's also touch on AI replacing developers. We talked about earlier, and also yourself,、um, Approva, and you spend lots of time like doing research and coding and explore different kind of models, and you're also talking about using GitHub Copilot. To code,、um, so do you think can AI really replace developers soon or in the future? Soon, I don't think so, and I have a reasonable explanation for it. I think, like just looking at the current trends, right? If you've ever interacted with these models, you'll see how they essentially learn from everything we humans have put out there. Our social constructs, our、uh, societal constructs. It's every All the patterns that we've put onto the internet, and even with things like AI agents, which are supposed to be "quote unquote" autonomous、uh, workflows or applications, we are seeing that they require some human in the loop feedback, or for a human、uh, or some other system to define the exact workflows to be able to、uh, do something useful with them. Whether it's writing code, building end-to-end applications, basically. If you need reliability, then you need a human or some other、uh, non-AI application in the loop. I think we've also、uh, one one last point I wanted to add is、uh, sorry. Go ahead.、Uh, I just want to add to it regarding what do you think of today's AI generated code. From your professional opinion, of course, I don't know how to code. My PhD was in material science. I don't know how to code, but I work on AI product and the cloud product before, and also received major best practice award for my AI product. So therefore, I was like, you know what? Even if I don't know how to code, I heard AI can generate code. So actually, I went into ChatGPT、yeah. and asked ChatGPT to generate code for me, and, and it was able to help me to create a machine learning model and to identify different kind of flowers. And let's、okay. really give me the code, and also show me where we can find like open source flower pictures, and also directly go to Google、uh, Vertex AI to try to train over there using Vertex AI framework. And I was you also give me lots of code that can run my own terminal, set up like Python on my computer. It's like crazy.、Uh, I find like、yeah. mind blowing for someone who doesn't know how to code. So yeah. Have you evaluated those kind of quality of the code before? Are they really good, or、um, what, what's what's look what's the today status right now? I think, like you said, right, like if if you're someone who doesn't know how to code and you're starting with something、uh, simple, like how do I identify different types of flowers? So building a simple、mm-hmm. classification model to identify flowers. Like when I was starting out、uh, in machine learning. There's a lot of such examples on the internet, right? Where、uh, it's that iris dataset, and a lot of 
tutorials or material for how to build a classification model uses these uh, publicly available data sets. So some, one of the things that why I think some of these model, uh, some of these tasks might be easier is because these examples have been quoted time and again on the internet. But what mm -hmm. I've observed is if you wanted to build something super complicated end to end, then uh, it just takes a lot of time to uh, provide enough detail to the model where it can actually give me something reasonable. But the way I use these models anyway is mm -hmm. just to get starter code at most, to just get me started on something really quick and then I'll go iterate and add specifics to the code that it generated. Like I've used it for query generation. So even there, it kind of gets things right, but um, there'll be like one little closet gets wrong and then that just makes the query unusable. So you still need to like iterate on your own to make the code like ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually I feel the same way when I use ChatGPT or other AI tools to create product management content. And if you go out to ask some kind of like basic product management questions, such as how to write product requirement about ABCD things, uh, or design this curric curriculum for AI product management bootcamp that we have right now. And guess what? The content was mediocre. It was good. It hit some good keywords I was looking for, but I was like, no, I don't think this is a state of art program I'm going to create. And I don't think yeah. this is the exact, the perfect product requirement documentation I'm going to send over to my engineering team. This is definitely yeah. something good enough to get started. For so they sure. within like five seconds, they can give you a sheet of things. And they like, hmm, yeah. this is okay. This is not good. So you start to filter information and maybe use it as inspirations. I see. So exactly. basically software developer feel the same way when you, when you see the code from. Chat totally GPT. agree. I think it's uh, it's best used as a productivity boost to like get you started and yeah, to get a little bit of a time boost in that sense. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you also said you want to add something about AI engineer. I cut you off a little bit. Um, Do you want to touch oh, back on a little bit? No, all good. I was just going to say that I think we also reached a theoretical limit on good quality data. Uh, and to a large extent, compute as well, right? Like we've come a long way in terms of uh, having very sophisticated compute resources. But I do think that if we were to reach whatever artificial general intelligence, uh, then something needs to drastically change in that sense. Like either we need to have a large, a lot more good quality data about things that are not as popular on the internet, or we just need to have much more efficient compute. Yeah, totally. And actually, this is also our realization when we developed the AI product inside the AIPM bootcamp. And let's say I have a data scientist uh, in our team, and her realization was so amazing. She was like, wow, through this AIPM bootcamp, I thought I'm here to create amazing data models. And in reality, what I realized was that the biggest bottleneck is actually getting the right type of data. And, mm -hmm. and the better the data, the, be the better the model uh, I can generate. And which is now leading to the entire, like, the, date, the, the concept of data is a new field of AI, which I totally agree. Um, but too. the great part is we also have seen people, um, for example, one hour team was able to get early adopters data for the um, uh, forecast, inventory forecast from a retailer within one month, starting using this uh, methodology to do voice or custom interviews and really getting those data. And I think right now, all different kind of like um, B2B companies and start to think about how can they monetize the data because most of them just do not want to give the data away because data is a new field. Yeah. They real, they, they uh, slowly realize this is the new trend right now and which also leading to the quality of data nowadays. Yeah, it's, is the entire AI space actually like shifting and based on data. So, so with that in mind, I also like to ask you questions regarding the latest like a database technology because we talk about data and the next, next part is database and maybe like building rack, which is another way to improve the model itself. And also the MongoDB themselves um, is also like creating lots of product and it's a cutting edge in the space right now. Can you tell us more regarding what's the latest technology in the data space or database, sure. data platform, anything about data? Sure, yeah. Uh, so like you said, right, uh, like data 
was always important when it came to AI, it's going to continue to be important. So uh, all of these data vendors, I think database vendors are in a really good position because they've been handling large amounts of data for a long time. So a lot of database vendors who were traditionally just handling operational data and MongoDB uh, falls in this category, uh, they've added vector capabilities to it where you could you can store now store vector embeddings along with the rest of your data. Uh, so right now that's the requirement because people are building RAG applications. But as mm -hmm. things evolve from say RAG to agents, I think database vendors will still have a place because then things like uh, storing memory, storing the state of your agents, uh, or being able to pick the right tools for your agents, all of that starts being important. So, uh, and I think things like semantic search and just regular search and retrieval is still important in that sense because you still need to be uh, able to retrieve conversational history or the right tool definitions mm -hmm. for your agent. So in that sense, yeah, I think that's how the trend is going to shift. Right now it's all about vectors, quantization. Um, yeah, vectors and quantizations. It's going to move to uh, state and memory. Awesome. Hey, can you use that as a baseline and give us a real life example regarding how one of your customers is using any of the existing AI models or databases you guys have? What kind of problems you try to solve using some real life case studies? Remove the, the customer's name, but just want to see how the use cases uh, is being used in real life right now. Sure. So a lot of um, customers right now, I'm trying to think. Um, so most of them are trying to build chatbots right now, but I feel like mm -hmm. chatbots is also such a wa vast field, right? It can be something yeah. as simple as just uh, having a repository of known issues and answering questions, or it can be uh, something a bit more complicated. And once you start getting into things like that, then things like parent document retrieval or hybrid search or this concept of self-querying retrieval becomes important because then you're trying to combine uh, vector search but also want to focus on certain keywords on your data. For example, if you're building a product search application, then just mm -hmm. searching for give me a size 10 Nike shoe that was released in 2020, that's just not a good fit for an embedding model, right? You need that Right. something that's a bit extra. So mm -hmm. that's that was a pretty interesting use case that I thought that needed focus on keywords, but also vector search. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Uh, now let's also think more regarding the LM models. We mentioned how to choose LM models. Do you have different type of framework to help people systematic thinking about what's the best methodology to choose LM model based on different kind of use cases? Sure. So like I, I like to think like a software engineer when I think about picking LLM models. It's like mm -hmm. picking any other tool or tool for the job, right? So yeah. it still comes down to what the constraints of the system you're trying to build are and what task you are trying to solve. But I think some common considerations still become like, what's the task? Uh, how much are you willing to spend on building this thing? Mm -hmm. uh, are, there in, are there any latency requirements that the application needs to, needs to res respond in uh, a few milliseconds, seconds, minutes? What's the time consideration? And then also security. So task, cost, latency, security, those are the considerations. Uh, I like looking at the LLM sys chatbot arena leaderboard on hugging face it's basically a crowdsourced mm. leaderboard of how different proprietary and open source llms perform on various tasks whether it's code gen uh question answering different tasks and it goes beyond yeah. benchmarks because it's real people testing these models so i would say that's a good place to go yeah, great. We also inside of AI PM Bootcamp, we also have another resource as literally going to compare different kind of AI models based on the criteria they're looking for, like speed, maybe scalability, and also put in a very comprehensive chart for people to comparison. We're definitely going to link it in the show notes so everyone can start learning and choosing the right LLM model for yourself. But I do agree nowadays, everyone just do chatbot. Um, it's kind of overused terms nowadays. I do want to see more innovation beyond existing easy chatbot. 
uh, and yeah. and really see how AI may improve and and change people's lives today. And、um, now I also want to ask you more question regarding PM and AI engineer. So this kind of new way of doing things and creating product nowadays. So in the past, when product managers were working on product, we're mainly doing ideation, talk to customers, writing requirement, and working with engineer in agile methodology. But today, we're all using AI in different like aspect of our product development lifecycle, and also creating AI product. How it is look like right now for AI engineer to work with PM? Is the process the same as before, just agile, or is more AI? Souped up version of how you work together. Can you tell us more? What's the、uh, day to day like? Sure, I, I think there's this interesting shift from PMs and developers having、mm-hmm. fairly clear boundaries of what their role is supposed to be. Right, like like you said, the PM traditionally a PM was supposed to go get product requirements, and the developer goes builds the thing.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are pretty clear boundaries, but I think、um, as these Technologies are new to everybody. It's shifting to becoming more of a dialogue now. So, with new tools, new models hitting the shelves every day, I think everyone's experimenting. Whether you're a PM, a developer, something else, everyone's experimenting, trying new things out. And then it becomes more of a whenever you're trying to build a new thing, it becomes more of a knowledge sharing discussion first, where everyone's sharing what they've tried out, and then you as a team decide what the best path.、Uh, Moving forward is in the case if a AI engineer that is what look like this. Your product manager have an idea of using AI to achieve some、mm-hmm. goal, such as do a home renovation. And so instead of writing requirements, the product manager is going to talk to AI engineer or data scientist, saying that hey, what kind of model do you think we can leverage? Should we build from scratch, or do we use some existing model to achieve my final goal? Instead of writing the requirements, am I am I right if my assumptions was correct? If based on、um, what I understand, in my experience, PMs don't even get into as deep as like what model to use. Like、mm. usually, it starts with is this even possible using AI?、Uh. Like does it even make sense to integrate AI into this thing? So then, like the AI engineers or data scientists will go and build some POC, do some initial testing to see. If that problem is even solvable using models and communicate what the gaps are, then the PM can get a better understanding of okay, this is possible, this is not possible. Then、mm-hmm. put together product requirements. So, I think talking to you made me realize. I think there's that additional step of like testing beforehand and then building requirements, whereas traditionally it's the other way around, where you have requirements and then you go test stuff. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, inside the AI PM bootcamp, we call this process is the AI hypothesis. So there's the four steps. Part of the AI hypothesis, you need verify, collect data, and build those AI hypothesis MVP and really test out can AI really solve the problem or not. If so, let's move to the next phase. Let's write requirement using、right. agile methodology. Basically, the two loops, and first loop is testing out AI, like just like what you described. This is perfect. I like great minds think alike. We both create the pro- the framework, same very similar framework <laughs> together. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I didn't know、awesome. that was an actual methodology. Yeah, it's it is a methodology we invented inside of AIP and Bookend. That's really I was、right. like. What is today's process? What is that? And and me, I have a team of coaches, and me and my coaches, you know what? Let's create a new process like this: like two loops, AI hypothesis, and plus the traditional the software development agile process. It's two loops intertwined with each other. Also has design part, also strategy part. It's like very comprehensive process. But I'm I'm so happy to see what you think in the market is in alignment with the framework we created. It's let's read the same. Awesome for sure. Yeah. Great, cool. All right, everybody. If you're interested in AI product management program, and、uh, we're going to put put it in the description of the show note, it is an end-to-end process to help people to gain hands-on experience, build real-life AI product with a team of engineers, designers, data scientists, and product managers. And we're also going to launch a product for you, and so that you're going to have real-life engagement of your own AI product. And we're going to put more information in the description of the show note if you're interested in learning more. Approva. Let me ask you this final question: What specific advice would you have for people who want to break into AI space? Regardless, they are engineer, they are product managers, or they are marketers want to break into AI. What do they need to do? 
I think um, going back to what we started with, right? Just start experimenting with these models. Start with doing it outside of work, then slowly bring it into your work. I think that's the best way to uh, just get a good feel for um, what's changed, how these model wo- models work, and just getting comfortable with like the new paradigm. Because like you said, like are is AI going to replace developers? No, but I think the future is developers who work with AI to build cool things. This is awesome. Great. Thank you for joining us today, Aprova. And what's the best way for our audience to get in touch with you? Um, let's just put in my LinkedIn and other social links in the video description. That's the best way to reach me. Awesome. Great. Cool. We're going to link it in the show notes. Uh, today, we share so much like amazing golden nugget regarding how to break into AI, what kind of different AI resources, and make sure to like and comment and subscribe to this channel. And this is Dr. Nancy Lee from PM Accelerator.io. Uh, I'm going to see you in our next episode right here. And thank you so much for joining us, Approva. Thank you so much for having me, Nancy. This was great. Bye. Awesome.